Hello. Today we're going to be looking at the combination of a timer and a counter. Uh, this circuit will be useful in one of the experiments in FED. That's the uh, the one related to the boardwalk wheel, um, where in addition you're going to be having another chip and a set of LEDs to represent uh, something related to what we call a game, where you may have a number of uh, or a certain amount of numbers that uh, somebody chooses one from and in this case as an electronic game it could be something where the speed over which the LEDs will go through in terms of turn on or off would be such that nobody will know the outcome when you stop the count and at the end of course wherever uh, you stop the count and whichever LED is uh, on that could be representative of a number and that number could be a winner number for somebody but in this case, it's just a matter of practicing with a timer, a counter, and a binary decoder. But for this purpose, we concentrate this video on the first two chips, which are the timer and the counter, in this case, a 4-bit binary counter. And we chose the 74163 because of uh, the simplicity of uh, its usage. It has features where we can download, uh, upload the number from which the count can start from, but in this case we're not using that feature. And we're going to be looking at how to uh, explain the signals that will, that will be generated by such uh, chips, in addition to the characteristics of those signals, and also look at how to implement such circuits so that if you are able to implement it at home, then you can save some of the time that you would spend in the lab trying to figure out how to uh, implement the third module, the, the binary decoder with its LEDs, to make it work and to make it, of course, realize the function that you're asked to, uh, to implement. These two are also important because they are an integral part of the final project, which is the traffic light controller. So it is important that you build these two, make them work, and keep them on the breadboard. Don't dismantle the circuit when you're finished with the experiment because you want to make sure that they are available for the final project. Uh, and in that case, you will, of course, uh, concentrate only on the final part, the design of the, 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 the control of the signals for the red, uh, green, red, yellow. As you see here, the timer is based on a 555. What you will figure out is that on, in this implementation, which is called an unstable multivibrator or free running, right? The kind of signals we will generate will be of the so-called a rectangular pulse train. Train because it repeats itself. As soon as you turn the power on, this is what will be generated. Rectangular because we're talking about a constant level, in this case, uh, type of pulses. One thing you have to see is that this is called the period. In addition, we have also something related to the time that the pulse is on, and that's an important time also. The reason is that T on over T represents what we call the duty cycle. In some applications, this is an important consideration. In our case, the only thing we care about is that we're going to make it such that the duty cycle is about 50% or close, which means the time when the signal is on is going to be equal to the time when the signal is off. At this point, of course, it's not important because you will see that this counter rely on a transition and will count every time the signal goes from low to high. You see this little uh, triangle here, and no bubble here. That means it is a low to high transition that controls the count. So every low to high of the clock, which the clock, of course, is going to be obtained from the timer and controlling the, the, the counter, every low to high, the counter goes up by one. And it's a four-bit binary counter. Four bits, that means it counts from 0 to 15. Right, because uh, that's what 111, 0, 0, 0, all the way to 111, and that means 0 to 15, and back to 0, and then it keeps on going forever until you turn off the power. To control the period, we are going to be looking at a combination of this resistor, this one, and this capacitor. 
If you look at the manual, you know that the expression for the period is approximately equal to approximately equal to 693, something like that, where R1 plus 2R2 C2, I say C2 or C1, whichever the manual says. So what happens here is that this one here is R1, this one here is R2, and this one here is C1. To get the 50% duty cycle, to get the 50% duty cycle, what we do is that we make it such that R1 is negligible. So the choice that we get for R1 is that R1 be about one-tenth of R2. In that case, if it is a case, like in this case we chose 10K and 1K, right? That, that makes R1 negligible. So we can neglect this term and the period then can be estimated closely by about 1.4 R2C1. Because you neglect this one, two times point, almost 0.7, that's 1.4, and then R2C1. Of course, it's not that given the values of the resistors, that's what the period will be. In this case, it's the opposite direction. We need to find out what components to choose for a specific period. If we are told that T is approximately one second, and we are told that in our kit, we, are, we have no choice but to use, say, uh, here, of course, I use the 100 microfarad. Uh, your kit may contain 100 micro or 47 micro. Say 47 micro, which means this is 47, 10 to the minus 6 farad. And so in this case, that means R2 will be obtained from T over... 1.4 C1. So you plug in one second for T, you plug in this number for C1, and that tells you what R2 should be. However, this, these numbers have been chosen only for demonstration purposes. And obviously, if you look, if you let R2 equal 10 kilo ohm and C1 equal 100 microfarad, in this case 100 micro, that's 10 to the minus 4. R2, which is about 10K, that's 10 to the power 4. They cancel each other, which means the period is about 1.4 seconds. Let's assume that this is the case, and of course we will verify it. You need to associate this 0.1 microfarad, that's to eliminate some oscillation in the generation of the signal. Uh, you see that 2 and 6 are connected together. All of them connected to a combination of the R2 and C1. Of course, we will see this in the, in the circuit. You see that 7 goes to a common node between R1 and R2. And 4 and 8 go to power. 1 goes to ground. 3 goes to the counter. Now, as I said, this counter here has been set up so that it does not clear the output. It does not load any of the inputs. And it is enabled. These are the inputs that have to be set or connected to the power supply to make it capable of counting from 0 to 15 back, you know, all the way and, 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 and around. And as I said, we'll use the output of the timer as a clock for the counter. And if you look at the output, that's a 4-bit binary counter, so we have four lines. QD happens to be the most significant bit, right? And of course, QA is the least significant bit. And we're going to put LEDs there to show that it works. I believe this is pin 11, 12, 13, 14. And obviously at this point, I'm going to keep it short. And I'm going to show you how to implement the circuit so that you can do it fast. You can do it well. Even though I could build a circuit that will have some efficiency in terms of lengths of wires, in terms of cleanliness, aesthetics, and everything. At this point, I will do it in a lab as if I'm constrained and by time, and I don't have time to cut the wires to the proper length, so I'll just build it as is. You may be in better shape in the sense that you may have a breadboard with multiple red and blue lines, 
And the reason I say that is because if you had a strip of red and blue line on top, then what I would do is I connect the reds together and the blue lines together. Why? So that when I use an IC and I need to have a connection to power from the top pins, then I would connect it to the upper red. If it is a, a pin from the bottom row that needs to be connected to power, then I will make the wire go to the bottom red. And that would make, of course, the wire shorter and less of a jungle. However, in this case, I don't have that possibility. So I will start from the close to the most left position. And as you see, if you want to remove, this is the tool that you will use to remove the, the, the ICs so that not to break the pins or, uh, or bend them. So make sure that they are in the hold before you start pushing in. I will not put the counter yet. And what I have to do here is I have to figure out the simplest connections first. So I know that four and eight are be to be connected to power. So I will try to use red for power and black for ground. Hopefully another color for the other connection, but, and if you remember, if you go from the bottom, bottom uh, row, you know that you go counterclockwise, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So four goes to, to power. I will bend this down just in case so I can see clearly. I will also have eight to, gra to power. Of course, since eight is on the other side, I need the longer wire, and hopefully this would do. Right? And also try not to connect, not to run the wires right on top of the, of the, of the IC. So that if I need to remove the IC because it's defective or for whatever reason that I need to change it, I don't want to disturb the wires, so you make sure that it is, the wires are clear of the IC. Then the next simple connection is pin number one to ground. And so pin number one will go here, assuming that the blue line is connected to ground, as you see here, that means I'm gonna connect ground, or at least a reference point here, and the positive polarity to this side, to the red line. Uh, so those at least are the simplest connections. Then I know that two and six are connected together. So I'm gonna start with those and two and six, which is on the other side. I'm gonna start this way first, and then I'm gonna bend it down again to clear a path for removing the IC if need be. Then the next component would be the 0.1 microfarad from five to ground. If you look at the 0.1 microfarad, it is this ceramic capacitor. So you take it from pin number five and you send it all the way to ground. Of course, pin number one being ground, I can also connect it to pin number one. So we have already located this 0.1 microfarad from pin number five. I would just want to make sure. This is pin number five, all the way to pin number one because I really wanted to connect it to ground, but since pin number one is connected to ground, might as well since it's closer. The next thing is I'm going to connect the two resistors, and I'm going to try to do it the most efficiently way possible without the usage of wires if I could, in a sense that here I want the one kilo ohm which is brown, black, red, and that is to be connected from pin number seven to the power supply. However, since we know that the power supply is also connected to eight, so we just need to connect this resistor from pin number seven to pin number eight. And that will do the job because that means it's from pin seven to power. Same thing, right? Connected to power or to eight, that'll be the same thing. The 10 kilo ohm resistor goes from pin number seven to either two or six. Since two and six are connected together, most likely I'm gonna go from, again, seven 
to 6. Or to 2, it doesn't really matter, but that's where the connections are. And of course, the 100 microfarad capacitor, which is in this case being of a large size, is electrolytic type. You'll see that one terminal is longer than the other one. Usually this is the positive and this is the negative polarity of that capacitor, meaning that you will understand later that for safety purposes it is good to pay attention to the polarities and try to connect the, these terminals to the, the, the potential that is higher, in this case the negative one, to the potential that is lower. Obviously, in this case, the, the ground is the, the lower potential, so we're going to connect the negative terminal of the capacitor to the ground and a positive terminal, which in this case is either pin number 6 or the, the common point with R2. So, if it is pin number 6, that means it's this one here, and again, since we're talking about ground, we can connect it to pin number 1, and again, I would like to see if I can bend this one way or the other, but of course without touching the other components, because if I do, then a short circuit between terminals can make it such that it will not do the job properly. All right. Of course, if I want to, if I needed to, uh, if I couldn't do it properly, then I would have connected it somewhere else, and then used the wire to connect it to ground if need be. Maybe in this case, just to avoid that, in case you don't want to be in trouble. So we're going to go for pin number six to some other column, right? And then use maybe in this case a black wire, and use the black wire. Uh, in this case, of course, assuming that I can, this is too long here, and I'm going to trim this side, and connect this terminal here to ground. Okay, sorry. We'll use a hole that is closer down, as long as it's the same column, right? And connect this to ground. So at least this way it's a little safer in terms of uh, touching other components. Okay, uh, we have the large capacitor. We connect it two and six, five to capacitor, to ground number seven to two resistors, the one resistor goes to six and two or two and two C1 and the other one goes to power. And so the only thing we do, do deal with now is figuring out if the output is generated properly. So in this case I will need a smaller resistance uh, for example a 100 ohm which is brown, black, brown of course, with these big fingers, I am going to use this. And as you see here, this is brown, black, brown. And the reason is that we want to make sure we protect the LED. Now, for the LED, as you see here, since we want the high to, uh, to, to turn on the LED, I'm going to use a resistor, kind of 100 ohms, between 100 and 470 ohms, to protect the LED, right? The higher this number is, the smaller the current, that means the less bright the LED will be. And the smaller this resistance, the brighter the LED. But if it's too small, the current may be too large and may hurt the LED. And of course, the anode will be connected to the resistor, the cathode to ground. Of course, you can interchange the, the LED and the resistor, and that would be fine, at least at this point when these two components are independent of each other and independent of other components. And so, if a high will appear at the anode, because this is connected to ground, a high will definitely allow the current to go through and the LED will turn on. And so what happens is that every time there is a high from the signal, the LED will turn on. And every time there is a low or ground on the anode, ground to ground, that's not enough voltage drop for the current to flow. And so the, uh, the LED will turn off. And so you will see a blinking diode Hopefully, it will do it blink on and off every second or so 
because the values that we got, the 10K, 1K, and 100 microfarad, may not be you know, uh, suitable for exactly one second, but it's an acceptable value. So from pin number three, in this case I use, uh, say, a resistor to protect it. And the anode, if you look at the LED, it has, again, longer terminal and a shorter one. The longer one represents the anode, the shorter one represents the cathode. We know that the anode is connected to the resistor and the cathode to ground. And hopefully, if this circuit is working properly, it should start blinking on and off for as long as we are able to connect a power supply. And you see here that I prepared the power supply to be delivering 5 volts, which is the standard value for TTL circuits or TTL ICs, transistor transistor logic. I'm going to be obtaining the 5 volts from this output, right? Of course, I could have also, in this case, uh, you, you may have a different power supply in your benches. I have also a 5 volt that is fixed. That means I don't need to set it up. Uh, every time I, I get the power from this line, it's going to be exactly 5 volts. Or I can change the values and set them up to 5 volts. And I'm going to connect the ground uh, to this terminal. Oh, sorry. Thank God, that's right, it's good to connect that first. Of course, in this case, theoretically, I should have the power off and turn it on only when I'm ready, right? So turn off the power, connect, and then when you think you, are, you have done a good job, like in this case, for example, I know I connected the, uh, the, the, the terminals uh, properly to the proper uh, polarities, 